Welcome everybody. So good to see all of you again. This is our sixth and final learning session in this Santa Cruz County ACEs Aware Network Learning of Care series. I'm Nicole Young and I'm one of your co-hosts for today. And we have several people that are um, speaking, sharing their stories, having a conversation. You'll get to meet all of them shortly. And I just want to uh, say a few acknowledgements about who's putting on this session. So um, again, today is the sixth and last session of this series that has been uh, hosted by First Five Santa Cruz County, along with the support of Core Investments. So that's Nicole Lezen and I, and our colleagues, Stella um, and Jasmine and Gisela, that are also providing bilingual support today. And these sessions have been planned in partnership with Santa Cruz County's Public Health Department, Family and Children's Services Division, and the Children's Behavioral Health, uh, the Health Improvement Partnership, or HIP, Encompass Community Services, Live Oak Cradle to Career, and Santa Cruz Community Health. Uh, today, we also have some of our special guests are from Community Bridges uh, and Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center. And so just a uh, Big, huge thanks to all of them as well for stepping in and stepping up to participate in our discussion today. Again, Stella Lauerman is interpreting today and we have our amazing new partner, uh, our graphic recorder joining us again today. For those of you that attended our last session, you may remember Giselle Chow, who uses the pronouns she, her, um, and she's a consultant with Lane Change Consulting. Uh, which is based in, she's based in San Francisco and resides on Ramaychush Ohlone land. So welcome again, Giselle. Um, so Giselle, like last time, will be listening to our session and capturing what she hears in real time using text and graphics. So just know the text will be in English and then the Spanish version, versions of these graphic recordings will get created and shared afterwards. Um, if you want to kind of follow along and check her progress uh, throughout the session, you can um, hover over her video tile and you see right now just kind of the, the first kind of template of her graphic and you can hover your mouse or tap on more. Um, there should be like three dots that appear over her video tile and you can pin, uh, select pin so that you can constantly kind of watch and see her, her work. Uh, occasionally we'll also spotlight her so you can see what she's doing uh, a little bit bigger along with our panelists. So it's fascinating to be able to watch that those graphics get created uh, in real time. Um, so again, those the graphics she's creating really are meant to help us identify and remember some of the key takeaways and patterns and themes that get discussed. And then they become a visual reminder for us of our collective work and we find lots of creative ways to use them. So again, we'll share those when, once they're available after the event. Next slide, Nicole. And so here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're finishing up with our welcome overview and introductions. We have a little piece about our network of care and, uh, and what that means to us based on some of the discussions we've been having so far, some of the work that's been happening on that. And then the bulk of our session today will again focus on this panel discussion, really centered around getting to know our network and, and more partners, different partners in our network of care. And then we'll wrap up with some reflection and, and some talking points or key points about the future of this network and how we hope this work will continue even after the learning sessions end. And then David Brody will close us out with our next steps. And as always, we have a feedback survey that we'll ask you to, to fill out. And so in, in our, before I hand it over to some of our other speakers, I just wanna kind of do a little walkthrough using some of our beautiful graphic recordings from our last session about this journey we've been on in these learning sessions. Um, so again, over the last six plus months, First Five Santa Cruz has been convening this series, this Network of Care Learning uh, series with a variety of health, education, social service providers and advocates and parent leaders. Um, and in our journey to become more ACEs aware, you know, we've learned a lot and developed some common language about the importance of addressing the pair of ACEs or adverse childhood experiences that occur in adverse community environments and really you know, have been explicit and um, intentional about acknowledging how 
that requires us to acknowledge our systems are rooted in white supremacy and structural racism. And so we have to make sure that we are addressing the right problems, right? That we're addressing the root causes. Next slide, Nicole. And in our last session, so you'll notice these, these graphics that I'm showing you now, they'll alternate between the English and the Spanish versions, but we've shared um, the full set of graphics in both languages with everybody. Um, so in our last session, we also learned more about California's new roadmap for resilience that provides a blueprint for identifying, treating, healing, and preventing uh, adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. Next slide. And then we've had the opportunity to hear from parent leaders and service providers. And you know they've been really brave and courageous in sharing their personal stories, um, having really powerful conversations about their experiences with stress, adversity, racism, how their own organizations are not only discussing these issues in terms of you know, what that looks like within their organizations, but then how they can be more responsive uh, in terms of the services they provide to community members. Next slide. And again, we keep coming back to you know, acknowledging and naming how inequities and barriers to accessing resources affect some communities more than others, including you know, farm workers and the immigrant community. And, and you know, in our last session, um, Diana and other uh, panelists spoke so powerfully about how you know, emotional that is, like that it stirs up anger, right? That, that, that these inequities still exist and that really we should all feel that same passion and emotion about doing something to change that, to fix that, right? So that was such a powerful moment in, in our last session. And so we wanna carry, carry on with that and continue these discussions today because, next slide, we really believe that together, you know, we can create our ideal network of care that's a whole village, that's equitable, that encircles families, where you know, those of us who identify as service providers or funders or government leaders that you know, we're really here where we can provide the GPS, right? We can provide guidance, we can provide direction, but really uh, it's, it's families, it's our community members that are driving this, uh, driving this process, driving the solutions. And so again, we, we loved the, uh, some of the phrases that were used last time. We loved the images that Giselle created and, and we really wanna build on that uh, in, this, in today's session. So when we think about um, kind of what we've learned in these last um, several sessions, we wanna kind of build on that. And what we're gonna do right now is um, actually give everybody a chance to share their thoughts when they think about, you know, a vision for a network of care. Um, and actually, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll wait and, and do that until after we've heard from some of our other partners. And so, um, you know, building on this idea of like, how do we build that ideal network of care? Uh, we're going to hear actually about some of the work that's been happening to really understand what does that network look like today? And what are some of some thoughts about where that could go in the future? And so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, our partners from Health Improvement Partnership. Hi, thank you, Nicole, for the introduction. As we transition into what the network of care looks like in our county, I also wanted to just thank our network of care grantee partners, uh, First Five of Santa Cruz County and the Santa Cruz Health Services Agency's Public Health Division. Uh, my name is Celine, and at HIP, our mission is to improve systems, relationships, and access to care. So we are excited to engage in this work with you all. In the next slide, I will delve deeper into the key elements of our network of care. So as Nicole Young mentioned in the beautiful graphic recording, the ideal network of care is a village, and the three main elements are community, clinicians, and care-based organizations with community at the core of everything that is being done. In our last session, we discussed the importance of having a community voice and engagement with the ACEs process. We also capitalized on the importance of listening to patients and engaging with the community since they are the focus of the network of care. 
As we come together to plan for the work ahead, the goal of our network and this grant is to help assess the community's collective level of engagement in ACES screening and trauma-informed practices. We also want to help identify gaps where additional resources may be needed to achieve success in the long term. And that kind of leads to the why, and we all want to um, have that end goal of just preventing, treating, and healing uh, against those harmful consequences with toxic stress. In the next slide, I will discuss how we found the consensus for the clinics. Uh, so in the graphic on the screen, it's broken down into step one, step two, and then all the way leading up to integration. In the first step, HIP engaged with uh, Santa Cruz Community Health and Salud para la Gente, two large federally qualified health centers. Together, they serve nearly 40,000 patients in Santa Cruz County, and each practice enlisted about four to six representatives, including a provider champion for ACEs screening and behavioral health providers, frontline staff, and clinical staff who all support ACEs screening. We also incorporated uh, clinic leadership to assess their respective clinic's readiness. Moving on to the second step, HIP engaged with the Pediatric Health Work Group, a local group of pediatricians, pediatric nurse practitioners, health, public health staff, and the County Office of Education uh, to derive a consensus based on the assessment uh, using the assessment tool. Some of the amazing clinical partners that were included in this uh, practice was Dignity Health, Palo Alto Medical Foundation, Salud para la Gente, and Santa Cruz Community Health. So thank you all for participating to evaluate um, where our county is on this matrix. Uh, at the integration stage, we evaluated the assessment findings and we also identified goals for the ACEs Aware Initiative. In the next slide, my colleague Paola is going to describe the process for the care-based organizations. Thank you, Celine, and thank you for having me today. My name is Paola Luna, and I work at Health Improvement Partnership, where we've been doing some excellent work to uh, assess where we are on this continuum. Um, so uh, my team was, where we worked with uh, community-based organizations to find out where they were in terms of ACEs screening um, and toxic stress. We used a survey monkey tool to us, uh, we send out to 23 organizations and community-based organizations are organizations that provide social services and they usually take referrals from primary care medical providers. Of the 23 we sent out, we received 18 responses, which is a really good turnout. Um, and that was our, our second step was to look at those responses uh, and take all their comments into consideration. We felt like there were three emerging themes from these, these um, assessments. The first one is that we need a centralized organization to monitor the training content and materials, um, how to conduct the ACEs screening and make sure that we're all practicing trauma-informed care. Um, second, we need to define our network of care, which is what we're doing here today. And thank you all for being here. Um, or we're working towards that today. And we all agreed and all community partners and uh, community-based organizations agreed that trauma-informed care really matters. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Paola. So I'm going to be going over the key findings for our deliverable one of the Network of Care grant. Uh, we had 14 questions to assess the readiness of providers, clinics, and CBOs, and since our focus today is on getting to know our network of care with a community focus, we condensed our key findings to reflect the four most applicable categories. So bullet one on the screen refers to question three, and it refers to screening and responding to ACEs and toxic stress. We concluded that clinics and CBOs are in the final stages of developing protocols and workflows. Moving on to bullet two, we concluded that we have a strong referral system, and this refers to question six of the assessment, asking about gathering resources and getting to know your network of care. Bullet three addresses question eight, and 
that is IDing and evaluating a strong network of care leadership and accountability structure. With this bullet and this question, we emphasized the importance of community and countywide support for ACEs, as shown by all of us meeting here today in our final session together. Finally, bullet four answers question 12 of the assessment, referring to financing and technology needs, ACEs integration into the IT infrastructure. Uh, with this, we stated that we are uh, in progress and we have widespread and improved technology. Uh, in the next slide, Paola will elaborate on the referral instruction, uh, infrastructure. Thank you, Celine. Yes, um, so the network care deliverable too was about our next steps and how we, we will be continuing to plan um, to integrate ACEs into our community. Um, so the Santa Cruz Health Information Organization, known as SHIO, is an information exchange for our community and county where all medical records are stored. So we use this to access medical records, but we wanted to make a connection between the storage of data and how are we getting that to community-based organizations who provide this service day to day. So um, we chose to use uh, the technology tool called Unite Us, and Unite Us is going to do just that. It's going to unite us and unite medical providers and community-based organization to increase care coordination. So um, this way we can share data across all sectors, the communities, the counties, health centers, and uh, Kaiser and Dominican Hospital are gonna be joining in the fall. At this point, we have uh, 40 community-based organizations signed up, signed up to unite us, and, which includes 60 programs. Um, and then, as I said, in the fall, Kaiser and Dominican Hospital are set to join, which will help make sure that we have seamless coordination efforts. So we take care of the whole person, the whole child, and the whole family. Um, and that is our goal. Celine? Oh, sorry, it's me. <laughs> then me again. Um, so what moving forward, what do we do moving forward? Um, so this here, this image that you're seeing here is the continuum, the maturity of the levels of the network of care integration. And our goal is to get to level number five. That's what we want to get. Right now, we're at the beginning stages of this maturing matrix. And that's okay because we know where we're headed and where we need to go. So it's important to have these learning sessions that you've all been coming to so that we can engage the community and we're gonna use this matrix to track our progress. Um, so we've been on this journey for the past sessions and we're, we're moving forward with this continuum of care. Um, so it's important to note today that we, when we think of our network of care and pro progressing and maturing in this, in this continuum, we learn that it's so important to not just have the grantees like the ACES partners, but also the leadership of the clinics, primary care, but most importantly, we want parent voice and community voice, which is what we have here today, and which is why we're so uh, thankful and uh, excited to have you. Um, so we are doing it, we're evolving, we're getting there, and we're getting that equal, equal uh, voice and equal leadership uh, because we want community leadership. So thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to share with you in this exciting work. Thank you so much, Paula and Celine, for um, providing such a nice, succinct summary of a lot of work that's been happening in a really short period of time, like the, that assessment and the survey and everything. I know it happened just uh, really recently. So, and that's helpful to be able to get a sense of, you know, where are we now? Where do we think we're headed? Um, and what we'd like to do at this point is invite all of you to share your or add your thoughts about like, where do you, where do you envision this network of care going and growing? And so I'm going to share a link now is the time to share this link to this Jamboard. And so what you're looking at right now is, is uh, my, the Jamboard on my screen. So I'll just show you how you can add your thoughts to this and then I'll stop my screen sharing so that you could add yours. Uh, we just basically want you to use like little post-it notes to add your thoughts about like, what do you envision for the network of care 
what does that mean? To, what does that phrase mean to you? Who do you think should be in it? What would an, an effective network be doing? And so to add, a, add your thoughts, you can click on the sticky note icon over on the left-hand side, and you can add your idea here and click save and it'll get added. And then you just click anywhere else on that Jamboard and you can drag your post-it around if you wanna move it so that it doesn't get covered up by someone else's. This is the, if you can, if you wanna add your thoughts in English, there's a couple pages to do that here, or you can go up to the top here and scroll across to different frames. And if you wanna add anything in Spanish, you could add it to the Spanish graphic. There's a couple pages of that so that if we need more room that we can do that. So uh, does everybody have, is it everybody able to add? I see some things starting to appear here. 24 seven parenting support line. Ah, could you imagine? Especially when you think about new parents who have this tiny thing that they don't know what to do with. <laughs> I remember feeling like that. Um, yeah, so leadership accountability structure, mutually respectful relationships, empathy and connection for families and classrooms. I'm gonna make some of these a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna stop my screen share now just because sometimes that can make it harder to actually see what you're doing on your own web browser. Someone is saying, I'd like to see the emerging action for climate empowerment work integrated into this system. system. Yeah, so the idea that, you know, it's not just, a, it's not only about direct services or programs the way we typically think about them, but, you know, caring for our planet, which affects people's well being. There's a couple of specific mentions of programs, all cove program, comprehensive, comprehensive mental health, seamless service, no wrong door. Educating service providers, care for educators, effective resource referral, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and leave that up and feel free to keep adding things again, either in English or Spanish. And again, we'll uh, get all these translated so we have a, a combined document here. But at this point, I'd like to have Nicole bring up the slides again because I'm going to introduce our uh, kind of primary facilitator or, or one of the people facilitating our panel. And then Allison will actually take it over from there. And so just wanna say, I'm so pleased and grateful to have Allison coming back again today. Allison, some of you may remember, uh, helps plan and facilitate the panel discussions in our last two sessions. Uh, and uh, Allison, along with Edendida, one of our other partners, uh, through their work in planning and facilitating those panel discussions, I think really helped us get to that depth that we were hoping for in these discussions. Um, and so today, again, is really just building off of some of those, uh, those prior discussions. And uh, so Allison, I will let you take it from here and introduce yourself and, and the other panelists. Awesome, well, thanks, Nicole and everybody. Um, I feel like the conversation so far has been such a great setup for our panel that's coming up, um, which really is you know, a chance for us to hear more stories about um, what um, Celine and Paola just shared, you know, what, what is happening with clinics and CBOs, community-based organizations in terms of their work to center the experiences of patients and parents throughout the, the development of our ACEs aware, you know, network of care um, through the screenings, referrals, and overall operations. Um, so we're hoping to just gain more understanding and, you know, further develop this network of care um, by identifying our strengths um, and our opportunities for growth today. So 
Um, I first want to just um, invite my awesome co-facilitators to introduce themselves. Um, I have a very um, easy job today because they're actually going to really run most of this panel. Um, and again, this is Deanna and Viviana who are coming back as um, co-facilitators this time. So Deanna, do you want to introduce yourself? Facilitadoras. Diana, ¿quieres presentarte? Sí. Yes. Uh, hola, ¿qué tal? Oh, Buenos hello. días. Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Valadez, and I am an active mother in Cradle to Career. I have two children. One is seven and one is nine. And I'd like to thank everyone for being here again, for taking the time to be with us, because we know that, that this event is very important. I also want to, my uh, co-facilitator is really something wonderful and a pleasure and I do it with great pleasure and with all my heart. Thank you. Thanks, Diana and Viviana. Hi everyone, uh, welcome. My name is Viviana Rocha and I am also a parent leader. I come here on behalf of Head Start to help co-facilitate I can't even talk today. Co-facilitate alongside Allison and um, Diana. I'm very happy to be here and I hope um, to learn a lot as well. All right, fantastic. All right, so without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. So first we have Marjorie Coffey. Marjorie is the Community Engagement Coordinator at Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center. We also have Yuvia Sparsa family nurse practitioner from Salud para la Gente. We have Dutran Kibibu, program director, Community Bridges Family Resource Center Collective, and Dr. Satu Larson, pediatric nurse practitioner and pediatric complex care manager for Santa Cruz Community Health. Um, and all of these panelists are uh, play a leadership role in their organizations in terms of the rollout of the ACEs Aware um, and trauma-informed services that they are providing. Um, and so we're really just excited to get more insight from you all through this conversation. Um, and I really appreciated, Paola, what you shared earlier in terms of our development on that continuum. And we really want to acknowledge that this work takes courage, that, that we're not going to do it perfectly all the time. And, and part of it is that having these conversations gives us that space to share our struggles, our challenges, and what's working best so that we can learn and get better at this. Um, and so I really appreciate all of you for bringing, um, you know, your, your voices into this space and really, you know, helping us understand, you know, how we can move forward more effectively. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Diana, who has our first question. Sí. Uh, bueno, vamos a empezar. Yes. Okay, let's start. As Nicole said, in the last session that we were in, there was there was a lot of power, a lot of uh, willingness to go forward and learn more, especially about what's happening. So in terms of the question, the first one I'm going to ask is for Yuvia, and I would like to know, can you tell us how uh, ACEs greetings a work in your clinic? What would be your, my experience as a patient? So, we are estamos tratando esta programa es es una nueva programa y cuando llegas allí y se reporta entonces hay formas que se tiene que y en esas formas va a incluir el cuestionario sobre eso de about ACEs. Yuvia, I'm sorry to just I'm sorry to just jump in for one second. I think I'm, we're hearing um, both the interpreter and your voice. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, it's confusing me. <laughs> okay. Are you it's able really to select? Are you able to select the Spanish language channel on your oh. Zoom app? Sí, en tu aplicación de Zoom. So. In the beginning, Marjorie said you have to use, do I just use mute? Um, there's just a Spanish language channel and hopefully that will work. Sometimes certain devices don't support it. So I'm using my phone, so I'm not sure if it's supporting it. I'm gonna do the Spanish and see if that works. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Entonces, um, voy a empezar de nuevo cuando llega si se so reporta. I'll start again. Uh, para la cita, entonces le da formas the, para llenar. The person comes for their appointment. Uh, they have forms to fill out and they fill out an ACES form. And if you decide or not to or not to fill it out, or if you need help, then you wait until until you get to the assistant, right? Because some people can't read the forms or don't understand exactly the questions. So then you can wait for the assistant and then there are people who um, for who wait for the uh, main practitioner. And it's also, and if you feel that you don't want to fill it out, you don't have to fill it out. It's not um, mandatory. It's optional, right? It's optional, right? Um, it depends on you. If you feel that you would like to do so, you can. Yes, as I you say. It's more having, you know, the uh, confidence to fill it out. It really depends on you. And that, that would also include that it comes in various languages in Spanish and English. Those would be the most common because as we said, since a lot of us don't speak English, so then it would be more difficult, even though if they wanted to answer it, if it only came in one language, that, that would be another barrier. So. So is it available in both languages also? Yes, because in our clinic, most of the people speak Spanish and read Spanish. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very comfortable with that response. And I think that will help a lot of people. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Yuvia and Diana. So I'm gonna move on to the next question here and I'm gonna be asking it to Marjorie. How do you see your role in responding to clinic referrals for individuals and families who have experienced trauma and toxic stress? What would I experience if I were referred to your organization by my health clinic after an ACES screening? Quick mic check, can you hear me? Excellent. Um, so certainly there's a connection between ACEs and domestic violence, right? So at Walnut Avenue, um, we are a family agency that provides services both for survivors of domestic violence, but we also have an early education center. So we have services that cross all the different age groups. Um, the referrals, it would depend on the experience of a survivor or a youth, uh, would depend on the nature of the referral. So there are a few ways to connect people to our services. One of them is to have an advocate actually come to a clinic. So um, any service provider is welcome to call Walnut Avenue during business hours. We don't have an emergency response team, unfortunately. So we don't do after hours or weekend visits, but Monday through Friday, nine to five, any one of our advocates is able to come visit um, any clinic or organization uh, in order to respond to a particular scenario, as long as the survivor consents to it. That's the only piece, as long as the survivor consents. Um, another option is if the survivor and or the provider who's with them wanted to call our hotline uh, directly and get more information and resources that way. So we're also happy to talk to support people as well as the survivors themselves on our 24-hour hotline, which is also bilingual Spanish. Um, the other option, the last option, is to simply provide our information to the survivor and say, hey, it sounds like this might be something that's useful. Why don't you try checking it out? Um, the only eligibility criterion for our services is current or recent domestic violence. So we serve all ages, all genders, all sexual orientations, all cultural backgrounds. People do not need to use their legal name with us. They do not need to provide any kind of ID or insurance or anything like that. Um, all of our domestic violences, violence services are free, regardless of their socioeconomic status as well. Um, we don't check on undocumented status or immigration status or anything like that. We do have in-house English and Spanish services with access to a language line if they have a preferred language that's not one of those, including ASL. So, um, and also our building itself is ADA compliant. Um, and we have a few folks who use mobility aids. So we try to lower as many barriers as we can. Um, and generally speak on how they're referring, being referred to us. Um, 
it's basically going to be, hello, my name is Advocate. I'm with Walnut Avenue. How can I help you today? Just trying to suss out what their needs are. Um, all of our services are also voluntary, so they can hang up on us at any time. They can meet with us, meet with us once and never again. Um, the only thing is that we're not ever going to initiate contact because we don't know if it's safe for us to do so. And also if it's safe for us to do so and identify ourselves as Walnut Avenue. Even though we do more than just domestic violence, um, certainly that's what we're known for. And so if somebody's associated with us, that can accidentally uh, lead to retaliation or escalation if there's violence happening with, around them. So I hope that answers that question. <laughs> Thank you, you did. And I really liked how you um, you mentioned all the different languages and all the different op you know options that there is um, for accessibility for the service. So I really appreciate you elaborating a little bit more on that. So uh, thank, you. thank you, Marjorie. I'm gonna pass it over back to Vienna for the next question. Yeah, and thank you. I just wanted to interject one thing that I forgot to say earlier, which is um, we would love to invite you to be listening through this conversation for kind of like an aha, um, maybe something, a phrase that somebody says or something that you could almost quote them on because um, we're gonna ask you to share some of those um, insights and those takeaways later on in our conversation. All right, thanks. Back to you, Deanna. Thank you. This question is going to be for Dr. Larson and it is, can you give an example of how your referral system works? Overall, do you feel ready to respond to the ACEs uncovered through um, the screenings that are discovered through the um, screenings? Thank you, Diana. Gracias, Diana. And I appreciate that question. And I apologize for the delay. I started hearing myself in Spanish. <laughs> uh, so we are still working on a pilot in our clinic to really flush out that we are prepared for this because ACEs is, is so broad and we want to ensure that we have the support system for families. So we're really looking forward to continuing to work with our community providers. But currently what we do is we refer internally to our behavioral health providers and if that is not enough or we are unable to provide the care that they need, then we refer out to Beacon uh, providers who are in our community as well. And we really are looking to have a more comprehensive uh, wraparound services for families because it is very broad what um, families may need related to ACEs and social determinants of health. We also now have a Healthy Steps provider to help provide case management for zero to five year olds. And we have a new case manager in pediatrics as well uh, for all other ages. And so it's very exciting to have this, but yes, we're still in a pilot study and we are still working out to make sure we can provide culturally sensitive, appropriate um, services uh, with any positive ACE screening. Muchas gracias, Dr. Larson, y es muy importante que usted... Thank you, Dr. Larson. And... I'm sorry? Yeah. Diana's sound cut out. Uh, very important to know that. <sighs> Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Dr. Larson. I'm going to move forward with the next question here, and it's going to be first to Yuvia. Yuvia, how can providers create a space where people feel open to sharing their experiences? Did you hear me? Yuvio, did you hear the question? I know you're on the Spanish channel. Um, oh, you just have to unmute. I'm 
sí, perdón, uh, por yes, favor. Yes, excuse me. Uh, could you please repeat the question? Yes, I will. So, how can providers create a space where people feel open to sharing their experiences? Bueno, la más mejor well, manera que se the best way to do that is to have a good relationship with your patient and about anything that uh, that your patient talks to you about, about something that's happening with their health, things that are happening at home, their work, that you always listen and respect the emotions, the worries, and try to and um, help your patient understand that anything that they tell you is very important and and that you'll always keep the all the information confidential and that you really respect and are grateful that that they feel um, that they have the confidence to talk to you about anything. Thank you, Yuvia. And Dutran, I'm going to um, pass the same question along to you. So how can providers create a space where people feel open to sharing their experiences? Okay, I'm going to address this question you. in two parts. One part is I'm going to make it personal. And then the second part, I'll talk from Community Ridge's uh, experience. Uh, in a personal, I remember 14 years ago when I answered those 10 questions, I struggled and my ACE number gravitated toward zero because it forced me to reflect on something I didn't want to. So the reason I'm sharing that with you over the 14 year experience with boys, young men, men and fathers, I have done those questions and to create this space. And it's really hard to ask people to answer those 10 questions when we haven't done them ourselves. So saying that, now I'm gonna go into Community Bridges' approach to this is, you know, I have learned <laughs> and in my work recently that we see close to 2000 people a year. And yet, even though we have done training, I'm not sure if our staff even have completed the ACE. So my first task after leaving this presentation is really to invite folks anonymously to take the test, or it's not even a test, a questionnaire. And I say anonymously because I think it takes away the fear of I have to put my name or my birth date or anything like that. It gives people a permission to just answer the question and it could be zero A's, but you, you kind of plant the seed, the idea with them to say these are just questions about what has happened in your life. And when you're ready, someday you may have one ace, two or three or four, or you may not have any, but you need to be aware. So the conversation has to start with an awareness. So in our community resource centers, folks are coming to us with a variety of need, transactional, really. They want a paper completed or a referral done. So as they go through, it's our job how to help them beyond the transactional, right? And to do that, imagine if our advocates completed the, um, the survey themselves. Then it's easier to invite somebody say, I have done it. Can I invite you to do this? And if you're not ready, take it home. Think about it. When you come back next time, we can talk about it. So that has been an approach that I have used, even men who are in jail, who are tough and strong and who don't want to be vulnerable. So part of this work is about vulnerability. So the way we create space is making sure we have the survey in their language. We have to be vulnerable. You know, most of the time we're asking our clients to be vulnerable, but we're not ready to be vulnerable. So this work, if we really want to do ACE, it's going to require us being to a degree vulnerable. It's not that I have to share which, <laughs> which question I answer. Yes, that's not vulnerability. The thing is, I have done this and I invite you to do. And then the second part is we know, I mean, regardless of 66% and even higher, folks have experienced at least one ACE. So we know as people walk in, if we're have the mindset that there is at least one ace that shifts, right? 
and how we approach. And then if, if it's beyond our skill set, we do have a counseling program and folks who are trained clinically ready to handle. So that would be the, nev- the next level of service for folks who are really experiencing multiple A's, right? But we know we all struggle with certain level of A's. So I think awareness is important and a little bit of vulnerability. And uh, that helps to create the mental and physical safety, builds trust upfront because you're not hiding saying, well, what's wrong with you? Saying it's not about what's wrong with us. This has happened to us and we didn't even know it happened to us before 18, right? So think about how the ACEs approach. And then the cultural perspective is important, both language, translation, literacy, and comprehension. So taking the time to do the ACE really, honestly, it takes less than five minutes to do the ACE, yet there's a lot of anxiety and people shy from it. So that's what I can say for now. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, pardon, Viviana, um, quería, um, um, excuse me, Viviana. I also wanted to say thank you, Dutron, for what you said. One of the things that I've noted, especially in our community, is that if the provider for example, in my case, uh, I I also come from their same community and I also know the same things that, that we have to go through, right? And also to live in a culture, uh, the American culture, within a, a larger American culture, it's always very important to tell the patients that sometimes living in both cultures is very, is very difficult. There's difficulty with that because we tried to live in, in an American culture, but we have translation, we have ex, uh, experience or Mex, Mexican or, or Latino experiences. And uh, letting the patient know that you also understand that and that can give them more confidence and more encouragement in filling out the forms. These are different ways that you can help the patient. Thank you, Yuvia, for um, providing your experience through the provider, you know, standpoint, and Dutron for providing that not only from the personal, but, you know, the community-based organization. Um, it was really powerful, and um, it sounds like you're an advocate for your team, which is really nice, and we hope to hear more uh, later on in the future and hopefully see, you know, the outlook of, you know, how the experience went for your staff as well. So I'm going to pass it over to um, Diana. She's going to ask the next question. Diana, ella va a hacer la siguiente pregunta. Gracias, Diana. Thank you. I wanted to tell you that I'm I'm so excited to ask this question because I want to know your response. And the question is for Marjorie and Dr. Larson, and it is. We know that individuals who have experienced trauma can face significant barriers in accessing and engaging with services and participating in them. The question is, what steps can be taken in order to address those barriers and ensure that people are actually getting the care that they need to heal? Dr. Larson, would you like to go first or would you like me to go first? Feel free to go first. Thank you for asking. Okay. Um, boy, howdy, do I have opinions? So <laughs> um, I'll say that I think the, at least in my line of work, the two biggest categories of barriers that I tend to see for this sort of thing tends to be either around resources, like the cost or the fear of cost and things like that. Um, also, and that would include things like eligibility criteria, which because a lot of us and um, ultimately organizations and other and clinics and stuff, ultimately we're still institutions, which means we have eligibility requirements, which means we're also defining who can't access our services, which often is the most marginalized of our population. So there's that. <laughs> um, so financial and uh, resource one. 
I think the other is the more emotional and social one, which is the fear of prejudice, of judgment, and loss of control of their own life within the system. So especially with survivors or people who have experienced violence, um, and also as that experience intersects with their gender identity and their gender presentation, as it intersects with their sexual orientation, with their racial and ethnic identities, um, all different cultural subgroups have their own unique ways of rap of contextualizing violence which shape the experience of and then the barriers they have access to um so it's that fear of prejudice of being told why didn't you just leave why weren't you stronger why weren't you xyz right um so those are the biggest barriers i tend to see i think that the the strongest strategies that we have i mean ultimately changing norms around violence, right? Systemic change means having to change the system. And unfortunately, a lot of navigate a system that is designed to perpetuate the very violence we're trying to stop. And that's hard. Um, and this is where I think making sure that we are not only doing the best work that we can as institutions, but also how do we disseminate the accurate information resources into alternative ways of service so that grassroots organizers have access to the same information because you know there, there's pros and cons to uh, different approaches and so making sure that people who have experienced harm have as many alternatives available to them um, especially ones that are the most culturally responsive to them and the most accessible to their resource availability um, on a more individual level knowing how to respond when someone discloses domestic violence or um, trauma of any other kind um, we offer training on that for free. <laughs> so knowing how to respond when someone discloses, um, having multiple methods of disclosing, especially service providers. Uh, for example, asking a question, how, you know, are you suicidal? Are you, have you, have you been abused? So like, there are lots of reasons someone may say no, but if you had say a poster with pull tabs in a gender specific bathroom, uh, where they know that their partner is not going to be following them in, well, that's a little different. Now they might be able to have a different way of disclosing. Um, and being straightforward about the implications, again with service providers, being straightforward about the implications of disclosing that information. What is the confidentiality? Who has that information, that personal information, and how does it get used? Does it get used? And who is it also shared with? What are the mandated reporting guidelines? Um, or do they know that up front? With trauma, because a lot of it is oriented around trying to anticipate what's going to happen, and preemptively trying to protect yourself from that harm, knowing ahead of time, being real clear about here's what you can expect, here are your next steps, and here are the consequences or the outcomes that you can expect. That can take away a lot of the fear and sense of loss of control when they're already experiencing loss of control through the violence that they in the past or are currently experiencing. So, check. <laughs> Very well said, Marjorie. That was fantastic. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with all that and what Dutron had said earlier. You know, it really starts with yourself as a provider and understanding what is ACEs and how that impacts. And are you willing to have that conversation? Are you willing to give that space to a patient? Get Take that extra minute. And that's why I'm also ready for a revolution. And I'm a little bit of an anarchist because our health system is set up in a way that does not support that. You know, I'm supposed to see a physical in 10 minutes and try and get through all these issues uh, related to school and injustice and uh, the family dynamics and okay. And so it is true. Um, there are those of us providers who then leave that extra space and then something comes out, a child, will, a teenager will start crying or a parent will start crying. And I don't say, oh, I got five patients waiting. I gotta go, I take that space. And that's terrible because then you have people waiting 20, 40, 50 minutes for us. And it's, it's a broken system that we work in, but we're gonna continue to work in it and we're gonna continue to make changes. So we have to make internal changes. We need to make sure our provide, let, and from the clinic perspective, that the providers are aware of their own ACEs. That, you know, Dutron had it absolutely right on the mark when he was saying, take the, take the test yourself, or test. It's not a test. Sometimes it feels like a test, but you know, read that questionnaire and understand why it's so challenging. People who come up with zero may have huge high ACEs, but are not yet ready to be in that place and are not yet ready to have those conversations. But we continue to ask and ask and you gain that trust and eventually but it may come out with the provider or the medical assistant or the front office or somewhere it's gonna come out and we wanna be ready for that. 
and think about adolescents. So now we have adolescents who are in a room with their parent. How can we create safe space for them, their confidentiality? Our electronic health records don't even have a confidential spot. So we put in a little sticky note, little hidden messages. So it's a real challenge to make sure adolescents feel safe coming to us and opening up and having the parent either outside away or on the phone and is someone listening and that's absolutely correct. And then also then breaking down our silos. We are also siloed all our organizations, especially healthcare in the schools. And we're trying to continue to break that down and bring more resources and work together because all of us are here for our students, patients, families, community. We want this wonderful big neighborhood. So conversations like this, parent leaders, giving a voice to the youth are so important. And it's wonderful that we continue to do this because uh, it's, it's a big job and to break down barriers. We've been trying to do it for decades and it's still, I'm ready for that revolution, but that's okay. We will work together here as a team and, you know, make the, find the name to the face, do a handshake or a hello, whatever is culturally appropriate and really get down to your level and understand, you know, developmentally where you are physically, social, emotionally, you know, it's not just about literacy, it's also about cultural health capital and how much can you really trust a system that hasn't supported you for so long? And, and the provider that's in front of you, what type of prejudices and biases do they have and what experience do they have? And is it gonna relate? And can you really open up to that provider? So um, yes, I know I, I'm a, a first, uh, first generation immigrant, but I'm white and so I get away with a lot. So it's a very different perspective for me. Uh, you know, I, I definitely, we had undocumented members in our family, but um, they're not looking at us as we cross the border. So it's, it's really important to create that safe space because it was very scary a few years ago and patients weren't coming to our clinic because they, they were terrified and it was rightly so. And so we wanna make sure if we're gonna start exposing this and be at their level, we provide safe avenues for them to get services because that's a whole nother issue that I won't get into now with Beacon, with people who have insurance and have their papers. So we'll, we'll save that for another time. Uh, Dutron and Dr. Larson both uh, touched on this, but I want to name on a practical level that for some people who have experienced different forms of trauma, the ACEs survey may be the first time that they're seeing it laid out in any kind of formalized way, and that itself can be really a big blow. Um, we used to do the ACEs as an example with our with our advocates during the our certification training, and we stopped doing it because of the emotional toll that it was taking on people who had never sat down and really thought about the chronological experiences of their life and really collated all that that information together. It was a lot. So even just asking those questions, I just want to point out that the ACEs survey itself can be. Hmm, eh, be prepared to respond to that if you <laughs> aren't already. <laughs> oh, Marjorie, I'm so glad you brought that up. And that's why we're still in pilot mode. We're, we, we want to make sure we have that support for that patient because it is, it is a big, we need to do it. And absolutely, we cannot just ignore it. But yes, we need providers and staff and everyone ready on board if that then open, it triggers a patient. And they, they also have years or maybe not even years, maybe they're a child or a teenager, but if they're older, years of crushing trauma and toxic stress all sun exposed. So fantastic. Absolutely agree. Muchas gracias por sus respuestas. Las agradezco for your responses. I'm, I'm grateful for them. They're very precise answers. And thank you for First, saying that you first have to think about yourself. I'm not going to wait to see what the patient says. For example, for me as a doctor, I, it's not me wanting to know what the other person has, that I have to examine myself first to see before seeing what the patient needs. Thank you also for taking up the topic of immigration, because as you say, a lot of people, we immigrate from our countries with just the dream of um, being successful, getting ahead. We're all the same. We all came here because of a dream. That's something very personal. And as she says, we don't, and nobody knows what each of us has gone through to get here. 
When I arrived, I came with my sister and we had an accident and my daughter, my, sorry, my sister died in that accident. And it really, it's very painful for me to talk about that. Perhaps because of her, I am here and I'm in the place where I am and I'm doing for my family and for my community. And it's good to take this up again. And it's very painful for me to talk about it because nobody had known that. But the immigrant community, we have a heart. And not are not coming here to do bad things or steal or we're not like that. We are people who have dreams, people who have families, and that our and that our dreams may be realized through our children. And I would love. That my sister would have been able to come with me to this country. And that she also could have realized her dreams. She was 22 years old when we came. And she died in that accident. But perhaps I'm here because of her. And I'm going to keep, keep going with my family for my family and for my community. Thank you and excuse me. Diana, I just wanna personally thank you for your courage and sharing that story. I, I had the chance to talk with you many years ago and learn that about you. And when you said that, you know, perhaps that's part of what's making it possible for you to be here today and be the leader that you are and the mother that you are, um, I really, I saw, and this is, this is the whole conversation, when we can create a space for, to build those relationships and share those vulnerable experiences, we can see each other in such a more powerful way. And, and that is what I've seen in you, Deanna, this just um, infinite strength and hope. And um, I just want to thank you. Um, Gracias, Alison. Um, de verdad. Perdón, pero. Thank you, Alison. Truly. That the words that you all said reached my heart. And I repeat, it's not just me as an immigrant. You know that I like to raise my voice on behalf of immigrants because I have suffered myself what, going through something terrible like that. But I'm aware that perhaps uh, my heart will never heal is about that. But if I can help other people to succeed and advocate for the immigrants, for me, that's something wonderful. And I will continue to do that with my whole heart. And, and I hope that as all of us are talking, we can do a lot of things together because truly we're here because of our dreams, because of our families, for our children. I repeat for the, the dreams that we have. And I'm sure that if we unite, we will achieve it. I'm sure. Thank Thanks. you. And it's actually a really good segue to our next topic. Um, so we can maybe kind of go a little bit deeper into this. Bibiana, do you wanna ask that next question? Yeah, I was just gonna just touch on one thing that uh, resonated with me from what Dr. Larson said as well, was you mentioned creating the safe space, right? In the provider room that maybe um, youth can have. This, I'm shaking a little bit because this is the first time I've ever even said anything, I'm sorry. Um, so maybe if I would have had that safe space during that time, then maybe I would have been able to speak up or say something during that time. And um, sorry, this is like I said, apologies, but um, 
it just resonated and really hit me. And something that also that Marjorie said was, um, you know, people completing the ACEs um, screening questions. I myself, I haven't even been able to finish those screening questions. So I'm here to listen and to be vulnerable. And I appreciate Diana, you know, opening that space and Dutron as well to open up that space. So I will collect myself and I will move on to the next question. Um, I'll start with uh, Yuvia. It's how will providers be trained, prepared, and supported to practice cultural awareness and respect for unique experiences of people of color in particular? How can we ensure that anti-racism is centered throughout the screening and intervention process with deep regard for their holistic experience? So hay varias maneras en cómo estamos tratando de hacer eso. Several ways that we're trying to do that. Perdón. Excuse me. One of the, as I said, there are several ways that we're trying to do that. One of them is that we have a group that is specialized only in the topics of equality, diversity, and inclusion of all people. And part of that of the responsibility of that group is to assure that the patients and also the people who work for Salud have the opportunity to speak up about their experiences, speak about perhaps things that have happened to them in that environment. I'm just looking at Viviana. To, to assure that people who work for Salud and the patients of Salud, we don't want them to have that, that negative experience of racism. The other thing is that our organization tries to have trainings every month from um, the main uh, provider groups and the people who work there at Salud. And we talk about different topics. Racism is one of them. Also, the, the, the quality of life of the people in our community and, and to so help and support our community. We also have groups that come in to give talks. For example, we just had a group from Triangle Speakers to talk about their experiences and be part of the LGBTQ community. And what I liked was that they had people of color and people from our community, and they spoke about the differences, the different negative experiences, some of them positive also. And than just going to a medical appointment. The thing is that it's important when our patients talk to us about things that happen, especially uh, racist things, or perhaps someone called and wanted to make an appointment and perhaps the answer, person who answered the phone didn't speak politely to them or respectfully to them. For us, it's important for our patients that they let us know so that we can assure that the, the treatment they receive uh, to help the staff person to be more sensitive to different people, different lifestyles. The other thing is that we know that we always have to keep working and trying daily. We always need to understand that we need to learn. We need to assure 
to have those conversations that sometimes are hard talking about racism and also remembering that that the experience that a person might have or might tell you, how, how can you say, to make sure that, that their experience is very important. And perhaps the provider might not have had that same experience, but it doesn't matter because at that moment, that moment is for the patient. And that's the moment where we can assure and also teach that it's important to us and we want to continue improving and serving the community in a way that is for the community, not for Salud and other programs. And also, I wanted to say thank you to Diana and Viviana because what they talked about is something these are things that I hear similar things from my patients every day. And in Viviana's case, thank you that you said that. Because always when I have uh, the adolescents, the teens at appointments, I always tell the parents to leave the room. And sometimes they get mad. They get mad at me. But I know that it's important that they have a space where they can speak especially things that they don't want their parents to know or they don't want to worry their parents either. Thank you, Yuvia, for everything that you said. It's truly um, informational and thank you for your last comment. I truly do appreciate it. Um, Dutron, I'm gonna say the same question to you. Did you want me to reread it or are you good? No, no, you're good. Okay. First, I wanna thank you and you stepped in in a brave space. And um, from a person who always <laughs> dive in first before thinking, I, I welcome, because I think you're, you're starting the healing and it's hard, but that's how we start. So thank you and Diana, we're all immigrants. Don't forget that we're all immigrants to this country. So people may not think that, but we're all immigrants, right? So I'm an immigrant, everybody else, unless you're native Indian, you're an immigrant to this country. So just remember that that's what it reminds me. So, um, so with that thought, how do we bring people into this work in a way that is mindful and safe? And Marjorie made, made a great point and Dr. Larson as well. We don't want to re-traumatize people, yet we, we have to find that balance or harmony in a way to invite them. But I also believe, I'm a believer of people know how to protect themselves. They have protected themselves before us, and they will protect themselves. As long as you provide the opportunity, they will gauge and they will engage when they're ready. But what I realize even for myself is if the opportunity is never given, then the curiosity, the why is never asked. So I pose that challenge and say, pose the why and let the person step in when they're ready. Okay. And I say that, you know, you may have heard at some point in some leadership program about the three analogies of a mirror, a window, and a door, right? A mirror just reflects back at you what it sees right? When you're ready, that mirror turns into a window. What does a window do? Shows you what's possible, but you can't go out through a window. A lot of the young boys I work with, he said, Mr. Dutron, but we can go out the window in our house. I said, but that's not the point, okay? And then when you're ready, that window turns into a door. And I shared this example, even with our staff. To me, my staff is my number one priority. Because if I support my staff and I create a safe space for them and I provide the right environment, they will provide the same thing to the clients. So culturally, we have to, the, the culture of your organization will also depend on how they respond and how empathetic and how safe it is. So training, it cannot be once a year. 
training has to be in every staff meeting and saying, how is A showing up for you? Are you seeing it? What can we do to provide you with the resource, with the expertise, and what's your experience? Allowing people to have a safe place to say, this is hard. People look at me when I'm asking them those questions with flat face saying, how dare you ask me if I've been sexually abused? You know, so these are not simple questions. So the training has to be consistent. A safe space has to be there. And also sometimes has to be a peer space where advocates or folks like all of us can have space where we can talk about saying this is really hard. And then the resources have to be there to do it right. So I appreciate Dr. Larson saying we're taking it safely. And that's okay. And we have to also be a revolutionary, right? So the revolution is already here. You know, if my good friend who passed in last year, she's the one who introduced me, Ama, was the first one who introduced me to the ACE. I wouldn't have been an advocate of ACE if it wasn't for her. You know, she passionately, I saw the passion in her. So we have to kind of embody that. It's not another flavor of the month program. Now we're doing ACE. We, this has to be real if you're going to do it. And if you're not, don't do it. You're going to end up doing a harm. I'm being honest. And so with that, all the isms, sexism, ageism, racism also have to be looked at. How do they impact? I love the double A's. Now we're looking at how does our environment that's based on institutional racism, sexism, status, gender, all of those are impacting us. You know, you don't have to experience those 10 questions. There is other stuff you're experiencing that every day you're impacted. So how do we address that? And we have, and it's gonna bring people feeling uncomfortable. It's gonna be uncomfortable for people of color as well as people of non-color. I'm, I'm ready to go in that space to have that conversation, but don't come and talk to me when an incident happened, how do you feel? <laughs> talk to me, what does it mean to be an African-American male? I can tell you how it feels. I have an experience, a vivid one. Invite me to have that conversation. So if we create that relationship, I think we can help heal ourselves, heal other people, and provide the opportunity and platform for folks to heal themselves. So we're not in this field because of the money, honestly. We're here because we're called on. I am here because I'm called on. So I know why my purpose is. So I invite you as you do this, ask yourself how you can heal you and create the space for others to heal. If you keep that in mind, you will figure out, your agency will figure out, your team will figure out what's the best way to train and prepare to do this work and listen, right? Listen to the feedback we're getting. If people are hesitant, it's the way we're asking the question. Maybe it needs to be a different approach. Talk to your colleague, lean on your peers to say, what's working at, you know, at a Walnut Avenue Women's Center or Monarch or Encompass or whatever place it is saying, tell us what's working so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and what's not working. Could you be vulnerable to share what's not working either? Because that's the part uh, you're seeing in our presentation today. We're all telling you we have vulnerability. We're not doing this perfectly, but the commitment we have is we want to do it right because it impacts each and one of us. So. And thank you for the courage of Diana and Bibiana because you're modeling, you're modeling. So thank you. Thank you, Yuvia, and thank you, Dutron, for everything that you said. Um, just taking it all in and really, you know, getting back to the space. And I appreciate everybody just taking um, the time to be vulnerable in this space. So I'm going to pass it back over to Diana. Gracias, Viviana. Thank you, Viviana. And again, excuse me, but my emotions got the best of me, and that's how I am. Okay. The next question is for Yuvia. How will the ACEs screenings serve to strengthen meaningful connections between patients and providers? 
Okay, so me dijeron que mi respuesta So then they told me that that my uh, response should be brief. The evaluations will help us know what are the needs of our patients, and that way we can help them. For example, if they need a counselor, or perhaps they need help with rent, or perhaps the person's having problems with their landlord where they live, or perhaps they need food. The other thing is, is to help also the provider, help the provider where the patient is coming from. And perhaps that will help the provider to be more uh, sensitive. So then when the person doesn't take their medication for diabetes, it's not because the person doesn't want to or doesn't understand, it's perhaps they don't have the money to buy it. And in that case, we can help give them a discounted medicine, or there are also programs that pay for medications. But we won't know that if we don't have that either that relationship with the patient or the um, the screening. And I hope that that will help my colleagues to know when the person's sitting there in front of them that there's a much larger story than what they're telling us especially in our community, that there are people who have gone through what you've gone through, Diana, or your parents have gone through, uh, perhaps um, a friend, in what way we, in whatever way we can help. If it's for our counselor, we can, we can, we have a, we have a relationship with Right, Watsonville Legal Center. Oh, excuse me. Perhaps they can also help with questions about immigration or residency, or if they can qualify for Medi-Cal. So that was the reason that I came to Salud, because I saw that, that they not only look at the patient, but they also look at the community and see in what way we can help, not just in medical appointments, but the whole person, in other words. Thank you, Rubia, for saying that, because sometimes you don't even know who to go to. And as you say, they're very complicated for many reasons, perhaps because you're ashamed or what people might say, we don't open up to what we really are have inside, but thank you. And it's good to know that you're there, not just, oh, this hurts or that hurts, but also that you know what we have inside our hearts and what hurts and that there are uh, supports available. And not just take some Tylenol and, and there you go, but thank you, uh, Juvia, thank you for uh, letting us know that. I will go ahead and move on to our last question. Um, this is for Dr. Larson. How does your organization work to amplify positive childhood and community experiences to buffer toxic stress and build resilience? Thank you. Well, we are always working as best we can to continue to improve and listen to our patients and our community. So we are starting to do more training of the staff of trauma-informed care and diversity training. We provide food distribution at our center to normalize pickup of food. Uh, we partnered with the Live Oak Cradle to Career to help create the community care team to provide care within the Live Oak School District for our high-risk students. And we hope to expand that to a bigger model and provide case management as well to support getting the services we need within the schools and our community. It, it is very challenging. One needs a lot of cultural health capital. Um, I'm gonna digress for a moment because my job technically at Santa Cruz Community Health is pediatric complex care manager. 
And when I try and explain that to my family in Finland, <laughs> they don't understand it because my job is basically trying to get people their resources they deserve because health is a human right. And <laughs> I still don't understand what my job is. So it is, it, and I have all this cultural health capital and I have a hard time figuring out the system and how to get the patient what they need and should have. And so it's very interesting being in this role. Uh, we also have now the Healthy Steps program uh, to help support the high-risk zero to five-year-old patients. And we are building a new health center that will include dientes and um, hopefully expanded mental health services and low-income housing for our families. We want to increase behavioral health services in the schools. We're in talks now with the um, Santa Cruz County Office of Education with all the new federal dollars rolling in to see how we can in each school have just walk-in services or however that will best support the community. Uh, and we are increasing awareness of providing sessions with the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, which addresses ACEs and toxic stress, not just for ourselves as providers, but for the schools, for the superintendents, for community members, for eventually patients. I know we have providers that want to provide sessions instead of prescribing Tylenol. We do a little shake and dance meditation in the room with the patient and, and release that stress. And um, I do have to say to Tron, I agree with you, the revolution has already started. And I remember I was fortunate enough to have the privilege to go to UCSF uh, for free as a doctoral student, uh, just, you know, five, oh, it's almost 10 years now, okay. But 10 years ago, and when I heard of ACEs that had happened in the late 90s, I thought, where has this been all my life? This explained all the patients that I had struggled with, which is why I went back to school to get school-based services, because we need to get to the kids where they are. And I thought it's just so easy. You just open up school clinics and you just do ACEs and it'll happen. And here we are 20 years later, still even implementing something as simple as a screen. And how do we get that? So it is, the revolution's there, but I guess I'm more of an anarchist. I just want it to happen today. I don't want to keep waiting. So I appreciate everyone being on this journey together. We're going to have to be in this for the long haul because the social determinants of health everything in our community is set up in a way that does not support this. So it's, it's big, it is a revolution, but it's so slow. <laughs> so, so I, and I continue to uh, want, and then, you know, I realized I didn't put this on my little cheat sheet on what I would answer, but, you know, I believe Santa Cruz Community Health hires providers who want to make that difference, who have that motivation, who have that passion to be like, we can make a change and we want to be here. We want to hear the voices. And I know I have used my privilege to try and support voices and I've gotten pushback and I've gotten, I, I've gotten in trouble a few times. And so, but I'm willing to do that and I want to keep doing that. And I want, and so I can't imagine, you know, a child or a teenager pushing against the system without full support. Uh, our families or anyone with a, who doesn't speak perfect English or who uh, doesn't have that cultural health capital and what people call literacy, literacy, but I call it more of this cultural health capital being able to engage. So uh, that was a little side note, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to meet all of you today and I'm glad we continue this work because it is, it is a lot and it's some days you realize, wow, will, will that big change come? But it's every day, one other person that joins the train and says, oh, this makes perfect sense. Let's keep working on it and just thrilled to be here. So thank you again for having me. I wanted to, I'm um, sorry, Viviana, to um, interrupt, but I, I wanted to also say that um, it is important for organizations to hire um, providers and staff that speak more than one language. And it is important when they are doing the interview and discussing the community that they'll be serving, the needs of the community, and are they on board? Do they want to help? Do they want to be part of the solution, not be part of the problem? Thank you, Yuvia, for that. And thank you, Dr. Larson. Um, Marjorie, I'd like to give you just one minute, um, just a brief anything that you'd like to add to anything that Dr. Larson mentioned. Join Santa Cruz Mutual Aid. Join your local mutual aid program. <laughs> Network, I mean. Um, uh, yes. Um, what was it? Sorry, my brain is getting hungry. Um, 
So some of the stuff that we have, um, because you can never start too early when you're talking about interventions around, so there's intervention and there's prevention, right, of violence, um, and it's never too early for any of that. So um, all of our services, or we have services that have reached across all age groups. The only one that costs is the sliding scale tuition for our early education center, which preferences low-income families and teen parents specifically, um, and also single parents going to community college. Um, so there's addressing some of that, but we also do free parenting classes with the positive discipline uh, curriculum. So, and it does satisfy like court requirements and things like that. Um, so there's that. We have teen mentoring with youth advocates. We offer free childcare for our survivors who are getting services within the building so that they know where their kids are. It's affordable or, you know, it's free. So they don't have to pay out of pocket for that. Um, we are trying to we are running up against barriers around getting education into schools. Uh, we don't learn about how, what boundaries are and what consent really entails and how to communicate those kinds of complexities when you're also emotionally invested in somebody, whether it's family or friend or dating partner or something. So um, we're always trying to find ways to get into where the kids already are, <laughs> which can be a challenge. Um, but we're also working, I've been given permission to share this and I'm so excited. Um, Walnut Avenue is developing a transformative justice program that specifically does not involve the legal system or law enforcement. It is based on processes. It's been adapted for a nonprofit context, but um, it's based on the same kind of processes that come out of particularly Black and Indigenous communities. Um, uh, marginalized communities that historically have not been able to rely on law enforcement or the legal system. So we're looking to create this in order to center domestic violence in such a way where survivors who are unable or unwilling to leave, who want some help in finding tools to try and get their partner invested in change and things like that. Violence is a choice, which means you got to find ways to support people in choosing other things. <laughs> um, and those resources don't really exist for the people who have caused harm. So we're trying to address ways of how do we serve the whole family in a way that is fully voluntary. It can end at any time for any reason, no coercion. You know, you don't have to be referred to us through um, parole, which is the usual, or probation, which is the usual method for nonprofit involved processes. Um, Self-identified goals and finding ways to keep families together in a way that maximizes safety. Um, with support from the community and also building up individual support networks for each person so that the person causing harm is connected to their own personal network, the survivor is, and if there are children involved, the children as well. So that's, I just wanted to share that because I'm super excited, um, but that's our big push and is something that I haven't, I haven't yet found a similar model specifically in a nonprofit context. And so I'm really hoping that it's going to work out because I think it addresses a lot of some of the cultural barriers, especially around things like incarceration, um, while also serving the whole family when violence is involved. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marjorie, for all that information. And this is the time to wrap up. So I want to give everybody a round of applause. If your video is on, do the round of applause. If your video is not on, do your reactions, you know, go ahead and do the <laughs> applause on the reactions. Um, but something that I kind of wanted to leave the space with um, was, you know, how I think and how my mind works. And it's by a quote, this is what I live by. So it's by Bryant McGill. Whatever makes you uncomfortable is your biggest opportunity for growth. I was very uncomfortable to be vulnerable today, but I did it and I am here. And I will pass it on to Allison to help wrap us up. Oh my goodness, Viviana, that is such a good quote for this session. And thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I was, I was sitting here feeling the same thing just in terms of this conversation really illustrating what's at stake in this work when we start talking about ACEs. And Dutron, you really, you really took us there right at the beginning, that this is deeply personal work. This is a vulnerable space. Um, and you know, I think my vision for our network of care is that we meet that vulnerability with love. With love for you as parents, as community members, as providers who are experiencing secondary trauma, um, and I, I am just deeply value the integrity and courage and love that you all showed today and just want to give everybody a big hug <laughs> because this really meant a lot. 
Um, and we're gonna have a chance for everybody to share their reflections. And so I wanna, again, thank um, Deanna and Viviana, my fabulous co-facilitators, um, and Dutra and Marjorie, Yuvia, Dr. Larson, thank you so much for sharing all of your insights. Um, and I am going to pass it over to Justin to help guide us through our reflection. Hello, everybody. My name is Justin Medrano. I am a behavioral health program assistant with Health Improvement Partnership of Santa Cruz County. And yes, um, I would also like to thank um, all the panelists and speakers. So thank you, Allison. Thank you, Bibi Viviana. Thank you, Di Diana. Thank you, Dutron. Uh, Marjorie, Dr. Larson, you, 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 Viana, thank you so much um, for engaging in another courageous conversation to help us all learn and get to know our network better. So now, like Allison had mentioned earlier, now we'd like all of you who uh, listen to the panelists' conversation to share the one sentence or phrase that has left a lasting impression on you, and feel free to uh, leave, share that in the chat, please. So we have a, a, comp, uh, a chat from Holly from Duton's, Duton's comment. The conversation has to start with an awareness. And that was a great um, connecting point. So thank you, Holly, for sharing that. Sandra is commenting on Diana's bravery. Again, thank you, Diana, for that. It was a very emotional um, story, and all of our hearts go out to you. I'm getting a lot of comments on just the openness of this um, conversation of this um, of the panelists, so we appreciate that too. We got a lot coming in. Thank you. We appreciate that. Siegelin, the revolution has started. So that, that's a, a great um, piece to keep in mind. The conversations are there. It's now the work that needs to be started. So thank you. Again, um, Jennifer is saying, allowing people to answer ACEs only when they're ready. And I, I think that's a great uh, point too. You need to be comfortable and willing to answer these questions, these assessments, and that's on an individual uh, level. Shelly Barker is saying connection with an open heart it will allow for transformation. And that, that is a great comment too. Uh, Romana is saying, Diana highlighting the dreams and commitment of the immigrant community and bravely sharing how her own story has impacted her. Again, thank you for those shared ex that experience and sharing that with us today. We, we appreciate all your comments, everybody, for tuning in and um, listening to our panelists and our speakers today. We appreciate you all. Thank you, Justin, for leading that reflection. It's, uh, gosh, this is just like each session and each panel discussion just keeps getting better and better and just so rich. And, uh, and I think all of you, you know, as Allison said, just really set that tone and modeled for all of us, like what it takes to create this you know, network of care that really is a village, right? That's equitable, that's compassionate, that serves its purpose, right? That it's um, supporting and strengthening and, and helping our community heal. And so I just deep gratitude for, to all of you for sharing your insights, uh, for being vulnerable on camera <laughs> while you're being recorded. I mean, that's just, uh, can't tell you how valuable that is and how much um, that's impacted all of us. And I hope you can see and feel and 
and, and know that through the comments being shared in the chat. Um, and so I'd like to invite at this point, uh, Dr. Newell, our public health officer, to share some words about you know, the commitment to continue this kind of work in these discussions and um, really embed these lessons and insights that have, that have come up through these learning ses ACES learning sessions, how we're going to hold on to those and integrate them into our work. And so Dr. Newell, I'd like to invite you to uh, come on screen and, and just to let you know, panelists, I'm gonna start unspotlighting you so that I can make room for Dr. Newell. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can you see me? Because I can't find myself among the many screens. Oh, hang on. How about now? Yes, okay, someone's nodding. Yes, we can see you and hear you. <laughs> All right, thank you. So what an honor to be here with you all today, especially in this place of bravery and vulnerability. And um, I'm very privileged to have joined this session and some previous sessions as well. Um, I know that um, you've probably heard a lot about from me about COVID-19 over the past year plus, but what you might not know is that this work the work around ACEs and early childhood development with moms and babies is my real passion. I was a practicing obstetrician gynecologist for over 30 years before becoming a health officer. I've delivered over 10,000 babies. I've taught future doctors and midwives. I've researched interventions to prevent preterm deliveries and done policy and advocacy work on behalf of our young families, including for ACEs and toxic stress awareness. I believe in this work with all of my heart. And I'm so very grateful to be part of a network, this network, among people who feel the same way. Although this learning series is ending and in a few months, the ACEs Aware grant activities will also end, these gatherings have been just one point in a long arc of our community's work to prevent treat and heal adverse childhood experiences, promote positive childhood experiences, and build community resilience. And the good news is that I believe there's a movement afoot, and we've heard that already today, the revolution is here, that our community is not alone in this critical work. I'm seeing a commitment to this work in our national and state leaders, a miracle. Our governor, himself the father of four young children, is very committed to maternal child health, so much so that he appointed California's first Surgeon General, pediatrician Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, to focus her entire tenure on ACEs. In December, she released the State Surgeon General's Roadmap for Resilience, a 400-page blueprint on how communities like ours, states, and nations can recognize and effectively address adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress as a root cause to some of the most harmful, persistent, and expensive societal and health challenges facing our world today. COVID has taught me a lot. Many of you may have heard me say that I predict that when we look back at this pandemic from the future, we will all recognize and agree that its greatest victims are our children not in deaths or in hospitalizations or in economic loss, but for an entire generation of children to lose a year and a half of normal childhood development, educational opportunities, social support, important milestones and rituals. This will take a lifetime of healing and recovery, and it will take all of us. The county's health services agency, public health division in particular, Family Health Unit in particular is committed to moving this work forward, centering equity, community voices, and leadership. What else have we learned from COVID? Well, it's no coincidence that communities of color have been harder hit in case rates, hospitalizations, and deaths. COVID has revealed stark inequities in our society, inequities that have existed since the founding of this country 
but have been laid bare in recent months. There is no doubt about it. Racism is a public health crisis. Racism affects where people live, where they go to school, the quality of the air they breathe, their income and wealth, their personal safety, their access to food and healthcare and more. Racism actually hurts people. It kills people. And this work that we have started doing here together acknowledges and works to address racism as a root cause of childhood and community adversity. I am committed to doing the work to become an anti-racist, and I know that you are too. Just as there has been much collaborative work done before the state's ACEs Aware initiative, we know that there is still much more work to be done to create the kind of network we've envisioned. We hope these learning sessions have strengthened the foundation of knowledge and relationships that will help us achieve that. Over the next few months, we'll continue working with First Five, HIP, the Human Services Department, parent leaders, health clinics, community-based organizations, educators, and other partners to more clearly define the network of care, particularly the leadership structure and accountability. While we don't have specific plans or events to announce today, we encourage you to stay involved and engage in shared learning and action as opportunities arise. Thank you again for including me today. And now Najib Kamil will lead a brief discussion to get your ideas about where to go from here. Thank you, Dr. Newell, for your words of wisdom and, and commitment, and as well as the panelists and the other speakers who have gone before. Um, so, you know, my, and my name is Najib Kamil, and I'm a senior analyst with Family and Children's Services within the Human Services Department. And, you know, this series of learning sessions has been extremely valuable. Um, it's really helped us build some shared knowledge and deepen our commitment to using an anti-racist approach to preventing, treating, and addressing ACEs while also building community resilience. And that's going to be, a, I think, a key piece of this, right? How do we build community resilience so that we don't have to have conversations about ACEs. We maybe sometime in the future, we don't need, um, you know, screenings for ACEs anymore because we've built this, uh, you know, very, a resilient community. And so now the question is, what will we do with all this knowledge from the sessions that we've attended? As doc Dr. Angela Davis has stated, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist or not racist. We must be anti-racist. And when we say anti-racist, that really means being proactive in dismantling policies and practices that perpetuate racism. That means looking at ourselves at the individual level, and it means looking at ourselves at an organizational level. How are the things that we do perpetuating racism? Right. And so it's it's a very action oriented step when you when we say we want to be anti racist, it is not a passive state of being. And so we want to hear from you um, about basically, you know, I want to ask a few questions um, and ask you to respond, whether in the chat, uh, but you can also take yourself on uh, off of mute and take 30 seconds to a minute to respond. So the first question I want to ask is, you know, what are your hopes about how the network of care will move forward? Can you hear me? Yes, my, we can hear my you. My hope um, is for, like you had said, that we won't even need ACEs questionnaires, but I, my real hope is that we build a community that serves it, um, and not just serve a certain population, but the whole community as a whole, and that people are not marginalized, left out. Um, that's my hope. It's a little bit, I guess, maybe too idealistic, but I believe that we will get to that um, place because we have this. If we hadn't had this today, 
if we hadn't had this um, echo, then um, we probably wouldn't have reached as many people as we have. And also see how there is such a great need and how many, not just providers, but um, community-based organizations connecting together so that we actually do a better job and taking care of our community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. Appreciate that. Definitely. We, I think it's important to have that vision of where we want to go, even if it sometimes feel, feels like it's not possible. But uh, we know that when we have a vision that feels like it's not possible, we can actually achieve it. So I appreciate that. Uh, Dutron, it seems like you have your hand up. Thank you. Sorry, I had some camera issue. I think making sure you have energy, Doc, <laughs> Satu definitely should be in whatever body you're creating because she's a revolutionary. We need the revolutionaries there. So, so that's really important because usually when we form these kind of bodies, the underserved and underengaged population end up being the least focused on. So, and the way we, you know, eliminate, uh, you know, the ACE, and I, I love uh, the, the point of eliminating it, we start one ACE at a time. So how can we work with Marjorie to prevent intimate partner violence? How can we work with child welfare to reduce child abuse? So those things are very, there's already systems in place where we can target. And then I think you need to engage the general population. So we had 85 people here. At the highest, we had 93 people. That's a fragment of our community. So we need to multiply that by 10, 10, 10, 10. Have these conversations at schools, have them in dining tables, having them in every beyond the institution. So that, that would be for me, the hope is in one year from now, we have larger conversation in a community about ACE. So I would love to see that and I wanna be a partner in making that happen with Dr. Larson and everybody else who has spoken because I feel the fire. So if you're feeling the fire, <laughs> we're ready to go. Tell us what to do. Thank you, Dutron. <laughs> Dutron, thank you so much. I'm very humbled by your words. Yes, we all have lots of energy. That's why we're here. I have a 12 hour day today. But, you know, I, I couldn't decide with this question, do I answer it as a representative of Santa Cruz Community Health or as a person? And so I think I'm gonna answer it as a person um, because I have not actually uh, been included in a lot of our own ACEs conversations in our own work or at our organization ourselves. But for myself, it's to continue to provide that open space for patients to feel that they can trust the provider and open up to them because we have so many marginalized populations. I mean, I work with the neonatal absence syndrome babies where moms have a lot of stigma for having used drugs, substances, sorry. I still have old terminology. I'm, I'm a very old provider. Uh, substances during pregnancy. Uh, the youth, my, my adolescents, I came into this, I mean, that is why I went back to schools. I wanted school-based services for them. They need a place where they can just walk in to have a teenager sit on the phone for 30 minutes to try and make an appointment when they need it just now. It, it doesn't work. Our system does not work for them. Uh, and we want the more preventative. We want to get when they're younger. And, and I guess I'm gonna continue to just try and break this, within our own system what we do. I'm always the one complaining about our templates and not enough time. <laughs> our patients and I keep getting in trouble in my own organization uh, because you know my I, I even fought for our staff when they were forced outside with COVID to get them proper equipment you know I guess I'm I, I, I'm glad that I can be that 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 person that looks at what's happening within my own organization and say is this really okay are we treating our staff well because if we're not treating our staff well we're not treating our patients well and, and I wanna to continue to hear the voices of the community because I'm, I'm an insider and an outsider. I certainly look different, but of course with ACEs, I'm very familiar with it. And so I, I'm rambling because I didn't write this out ahead of time. 
because I'm trying to think off the top of my head, but I am grateful for everyone here because all of you lift me up and get me out of bed every day to know that if I can save one more child's life to make them realize what they're experiencing is perhaps not the best circumstances. You know, they, the kids, they think it's normal what they're going through or, or they, they don't think it's normal, that's wrong to say. But I, I just want to continue to give that voice to the kids and teens and also adults that don't have that voice. So thank you for being the guides that you are. All of you every day inspire me and teach me something new and I love it. And that's why I'm here in this day. So thank you for letting me participate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Larson. And if you have any other thoughts about that question, please feel free to put them in the chat because I want to kind of move us forward to the next question, which is how will we as a network of care hold ourselves accountable for always centering community voice and leadership, racial equity, and anti-racism, right? So some of the things that we just talked about, how are we going to make sure that we are actually doing it and not just saying it? So once again, feel free to put that in, in the chat, or if you wanna take yourself off of mute, you know, spend 30 seconds to a minute to uh, share your uh, thoughts with us. Yes, in the chat, you know, we need more parent and youth voices and representations. Do you guys see that Amanda has her hand raised? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Amanda. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. What I want to say is that it starts with us. <laughs> so I feel like the individual work is what needs to be done. And that's looking at us and seeing how as providers and as people in this community, how are we serving the community? But how are we also potentially harming or gatekeeping the community? from reaching their fullest potential. So I just really wanna say this work very much starts with us. It doesn't start with how do, how do we get the community to do um, our work, right? It starts with us. How do we mold ourselves to fit the needs of the community? So I think it's very individualistic. I think we need to do our internal work, our biases, our thoughts, um, everything like that. I think we need to look at it internally and then moving forward, that's how we improve our agency and our community and the work that we do. So just wanted to say it's us. Great. Thank you, Amanda. That is so true. And I appreciate you calling that out. Anybody else would like to say anything? Just please take yourself off of mute. Um, just seeing some comments in, in the uh, chat about practicing awareness of internal bias and creating opportunity for all. Can I add something to the voice of our community members? Because sure. I've used my voice before with all my privilege and it's scary and I've been fearful. So I want to hear the voice and I want to include families, but I, I want to ensure, how do we ensure that their, their voice doesn't get them in trouble or that they don't feel safe saying these things? Like, it, I, I don't, I want to just, I, you know, I, I always thought whistleblower rules, I was never quite sure why they were out there, and I read it, and I just checked off, oh, sure, 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 and then once you get involved, you realize, oh, that's why this is legal. So, I, I, it's just something that I'm recently thinking now uh, at this time. I never would have thought that before. I always just, like Dutron, just jump in and figure it out later, uh, sink or swim. But now I'm starting to realize um, it's way more complicated than that. Just, I mean, I want them to bring them to the table. At least let's get that set up. But if we bring them to the table, how do we protect them? I just want to make sure that everyone's protected. So I never thought of that before this. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Larson. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, I think what we discussed in previous sessions, as well as this session, you know, how do we build that relationship? The relationship piece is critical, right, to build that trust um, with the community, not just, you know, between agencies, but with the community. 
And then how do we ensure having uh, what we call safe spaces or brave and brave spaces where people can say what they need to say without having any type of ramification. So I think it, it requires us to really be thoughtful in, in building that type of um, organizational culture, as was mentioned by um, a couple of speakers. So yeah, it's a good point. All right, um, just checking on the time. I want to just you know please keep the you know chat going. Uh, we're all we're collecting all this information. It's really important feedback. We want to know because this is going to help us think about how do we move this work forward. So you know please keep that coming. And I just want to end with one last question, uh, which is you know what is your commitment to moving this work forward and creating the network of care that we've envisioned. Um, so please put that in the chat um, so that we can record it and then we can ask you about it later. Just kidding. Um, but, you know, it could be a way for us to hold ourselves accountable, right? We talked about it. Um, so let's now do something about it. And that's really important. I think, you know, we tend to, uh, we've talked a lot about training. It's been mentioned and we tend to stop there. You know, we, we go through this model of like, oh, what I what I understood when I was a trainer was, this kind of train and hope model, right? You give somebody a training and hope that something happens, right? And it has to go beyond that. You know, it has to be part of what we do as an organization, as we do as people, becomes part of our practice. And we have built the mechanism, mechanisms to hold ourselves accountable when we want to make something, uh, when we want to make a change. So please, you know, uh, in the chat, please let us know what your commitment is, what your organization's commitment is to really moving forward with the network of care as we have envisioned uh, to center the community voice and leadership, racial equity, and anti-racism. And while you're doing that, I'm going to hand it off to Nicole and uh, David to uh, kind of end us, uh, send us off on our way. Thank you, Najeev. That was uh, so valuable to be able to have that time for some discussion and hear from other participants uh, on the call today. And I'm actually going to turn it right over to David to close us out. Thanks, Nicole. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, you know, when we were planning this last session, I, I thought I got like the easy job of just a couple minutes to sort of wrap up and uh, next steps, but it's been such a powerful series for me to participate in personally and professionally. Um, and this this uh, meeting today in particular, that, you know, at many levels, and this is rare for me, <laughs> at a bit of a loss for words, you know, how else in the face of such powerful, emotional and real testimony can we make that commitment? Can we express our gratitude? Um, and can we just, you know, redouble our intention and our efforts moving forward to create a community um, where ACEs don't exist in a community of healing where they do? Um, so I guess I just want to, you know, briefly acknowledge everybody. And again, kind of in the context of there's just no way to do it as well as we should. But I want to say again how incredibly grateful we are. Um, well, let me just start with our organizers to give the Nicoles um, credit to our team members who really often pushed me uh, and others to kind of to engage in this work, to seek and do the, the difficult work of seeking the grants and managing them to public health, to, to Najib. I, 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 I can't give him credit enough for pushing us beyond the comfort level of just meeting the basic requirements of the ACEs AWARE grant, but really pushing us to turn this into what it is and what it's becoming. Um, and of course, our, our parent community panelists, um, some of the most beautiful and inspiring people I've ever had the privilege to, to know in any way, shape or form, um, to Dr. Newell, uh, your words always inspire and to hear them from you after coming out of what you've experienced and the leadership you've shown in the last year and a half um, 
again, you know, words kind of fail me. Um, I think I'll stop because inevitably I'll, I'll forget, you know, some, someone that I really want to recognize that I haven't, but I hope everyone who's participated today and in, in the series all year, hears all of us, um, how grateful we are uh, for, your, for your commitment to the work and, and most importantly, for your commitment moving forward. And along those lines, I just want to, you know, express from my professional seat at First Five and on behalf of our commission, our wholehearted commitment um, to continuing this effort, to creating an anti-racist community in Santa Cruz County, to fundamentally preventing um, uh, the experience of ACEs, uh, and in large part by creating those community environments that no longer generate ACEs. And that will take both immediate work that we all have to attend to and long-term strategic work. Um, so as Dr. Newell said, whether, whether there, there is no grant funding immediately in front of us, so we can say this grant is now coming online as of July 1. Um, there are a number of opportunities uh, that, that are available now that we're looking at and ones that will be available in the near future. So I can say with high confidence that we will have some additional resources going into next year to help us continue this work. But even if we didn't, um, I know uh, from a first five perspective and the perspective of all our partners that the work will continue. Uh, it won't stop because it's fundamental to all of our missions um, public health, first five, human services, child welfare, and everybody on this call. So anyways, I'm, I'm just, a, I'm a little emotional responding to everything I've heard today, but I, I, I can't say it strongly enough that as, as the executive director of first five and organization, we are fully committed. Uh, and as Dr. Newell said, it, it includes a commitment to further developing that leadership and accountability structure, one that is um, centered on equity and centered on community and parent voice. And, um, you know, getting to uh, uh, the question earlier about how we support parents and community in being able to really truly and safely bring that voice, um, there's a lot that we're working on. And, and so that, those, those, that is not lost on us at all. And we're leveraging the experiences um, and great works that we've seen in our community, both in Live Oak and in Watsonville in, in how to make that happen in a real, and um, sustained way. Um, and of course, you know, speaking some of the early comments, we also have to be a part of attending to uh, the change that's necessary, even at the federal and certainly at the state policy level, to uh, end the, the sort of incentive structure that creates the dysfunction that was described in terms of often how um, clinicians are forced to serve families and how families experience their visits with clinicians, often driven by money uh, and financing incentives. Those can be changed. Those are policy issues. Uh, and there actually is some interesting work going on that it could at least hopefully improve that environment. Um, and, you know, just from a, again, a first five perspective, I'll say uh, we're fundamentally connected to and concerned with prevention. That's in our DNA. We will continue to do everything we have been doing. And again, uh, uh, fully committed to continuing this conversation uh, with all of our partners. Um, okay, I don't know what else I can say. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. And I know I need to encourage you also as we close out, you know, we are a learning entity and organization and enterprise. So please take a moment uh, while it's fresh in your mind uh, to click on the link that's provided now in the uh, screen share uh, and complete the survey. So we ensure that we truly are getting everyone's input uh, on what went well and what we can improve and how we should move forward in this work. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you everyone for being here. And uh, I can see, I still feel the emotion. <laughs> I can feel it like right up here in my chest. Uh, this was really powerful. So thank you all so much. And we will see you all again soon.